by throwing into the water the peaks of mountains whose trees and other vegetation had been shaken by the hands of great monkeys. Lord Ramachandra went to Lanka to release Sita Devi from the clutches of Ravana. With the direction and help of Vidishana, Ravana's brother, the Lord, along with the monkey soldiers, headed by Sugriva, Nila, and Hanuman, entered Ravana's kingdom, Lanka, which had previously been burnt by Hanuman. Purport. Great mountain peaks covered with trees and plants were thrown into the sea by the monkey soldiers and began to float by the supreme will of the Lord. By the supreme will of the Lord, many great planets float weightlessly in space like swabs of cotton. If this is possible, why should great mountain peaks not be able to float on water? This is the omnipotence of the Supreme Personality of God. He can do anything and everything He likes because He is not under the control of material nature. Indeed, material nature is controlled by him. Only under his direction does prakriti, or material nature, work. Similar information is given in the Brahma Samhita. Yes, yajnaya. Ramati Samrita Kala Chakro Govinda Describing how material nature works, the Brahma Samhita says that the sun moves as desired by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Consequently, for Lord Ramachandra to construct a bridge over the Indian Ocean with the help of monkey soldiers who threw great mountain peaks into the water is not at all wonderful. It is wonderful only in the sense that it has kept the name and fame of Lord Ramachandra eternally celebrated. And so ends Shiva Brahman's purport to this verse. Shugadeva Goswami said after constructing a bridge over the ocean <coughs> by throwing into the water the peaks of mountains whose trees and other vegetation have been shaken by the hands of great monkeys, Lord Ramachandra went to Lanka to release Sita Devi from the clutches of Ravana. With the direction and help of Vidishana, Ravana's brother, the Lord, along with the monkey soldiers, headed by Sugriva, Nila, and Hanuman, entered Ravana's kingdom, Lanka, which had previously been burnt by Hanuman. There's a lot packed into this one verse, as with all the verses of this chapter. Because Shukadeva Goswami wants to <coughs> summarize <coughs> Ram and Lila, as he says to Maharaj Brikshit in the beginning of this narration, he said, You already know this, you're already familiar, so I'm just going to give you a, a summary. As a kind of reminder, one might say. At the same time, in his summary, he's being selective. If 
you're summarizing, you can't tell everything, so what are you going to tell? You have to be selective. So, Shukadev is being selective in what he tells. He's emphasizing certain things and putting aside other things. Sometimes the pastimes of the Lord are contracted and sometimes they're expanded and sometimes they're expanded more and more and they keep expanding. And after all, the pastimes of the Lord are, what do we say, unlimited, which one understanding of this is uh, they're going on as we speak, they're expanding as we speak, and indeed they're expanding in a sense through the discussions of the devotees. And the Bhagavatam is, of course, simultaneously an expansion and a contraction of uh, the descriptions of the pastimes of the Lord. The verse starts with the word Bhagavā, having, after constructing, uh, the word could also mean bound, having bound. So, we can think if you have two land masses and you connect them with, with a, a bridge, you are, in a sense, bind, binding them together. So this is what the Lord is doing, and Raghupati is doing this with help. And this is, I would say, rather much emphasized in this verse. Uh, we get a lot of, uh, in Sanskrit grammar, uh, instrumental case. Vividadri uh, kutai. But that's not, well, yeah, that's also the help. Then we have the help of mountains, peaks of mountains, kuta. Uh, then we have Kapindra Karakambita Guru Hangai uh, with uh, the help or tree, sorry, mountains which have trees and plants which have been shaken by powerful monkeys. <laughs> That's all part of the first half of the verse. Which mountains, you might ask? It's. Uh, just an interesting side note that among various versions of the story of uh, Govardhan Hill, one is that Hanuman was bringing Govardhan to be one of the mountains to be this bridge, this Setu. And how did it happen that Govardhan ends up where it does, in Raja? Well, by the time he gets to Raja, he's of course carrying the mountain and flying through the air, flying mountains, flying through the air, why not? With flying monkeys, why not? <laughs> Everything is possible. Hanuman hears the sound of a conch blowing and he immediately understands this conch blowing is a signal that sufficient mountains have been gathered, the bridge is complete, no more need for any more mountains. Hanuman thinking, what's the point? to bring Govardhan further, so he drops it in Raja, plunk, smash, crunch, and he keeps going back to Raja. Yeah. That's why Govardhan 
is so many rocks sort of broken up and maybe why it's also so flat because Hanuman has, has dropped. Okay, that's one story. And somebody is going to ask me, where does that story come from? And I will say, Skanda Purana. And I will say Skanda Purana because it's a way of saying, I don't know, but it's, it's there. It's in Shastra. Okay. So, he's producing, he means Raghupati, is producing with the help of Sugriva Nila Hanuman uh, Pramuga, headed by Sugriva Nila and Hanuman uh, and Anika uh, soldiers. He's producing all of this. So he's getting help. And I think this is an important point for us that the Lord despite being independent, despite not needing any help, takes help. And here he takes a lot of help. One might consider, Srila Prabhupada is emphasizing in the purport how it is uh, quite simple for the Lord to make um, mountains float and he gives as an example or as an argument that he is arranging for planets to float. And what is the analogy that he gives? Float, planets are floating like swabs of cotton. <laughs> uh, weightlessly they are floating. So if the Lord can do this, then certainly it is not difficult for Him to make mountains float on water. This is a particular type of reasoning or argument. It's called Kaimutya Nyaya, or in uh, <coughs> In Latin, it would be called argumentum a fortiori, an argument based on greater strength. And the, the idea is that it's reasonable to take it that if there's something greater, something lesser is included. Sometimes this argument can be used in reverse. If something lesser has been accomplished, then certainly, or if something lesser exists, then something greater can also be the case. So it works in both cases, a fortiori arguments, kaimu, kaimutya. It comes, uh, the Sanskrit kaimutya, comes from Kim Uta, which means what to speak of. Uh, Krishna can make uh, planets float, actually no, the other way in this case. Krishna can make mountains float in water. What to speak of that? He can make mountains float in the sky. So that argument, that's a way of argument and it's a way of connecting, it's a way of understanding that something is indeed uh, plausible. Now we know that anumana, or reasoning, is not our final, it's not our ultimate uh, source of understanding of pramana. However, it is a source of support for the ultimate pramana. And what is the ultimate pramana? Shabda, shabda pramana. Therefore, Shiva Prabhupada's purport is giving a couple of verses as shabda pramana for this point that 
the Lord is all powerful, Maya Yachena Prakriti, Suyate Sachara Charam, everything is uh, working under his supervision. Maya Adyaksha literally means uh, Maya by me, Adyaksha by my supervision. Adyaksha, the, the same word is there in Sanskrit. So, to support that or to give us uh, help in accepting how everything is under the control of the Lord, we get this. Kaimutya uh, Nyaya or a fortiori argument. And what struck me about this argument is that we we also use it in our own cases for ourselves. Uh, the Lord, of course, is capable of doing these things, and we say, yes, of course, he can do these things. Because he is the Lord, he is a supreme controller. And one might even ask, since Lord Ramachandra is the supreme controller and he's all-powerful, why did he go to all this trouble uh, to make this setu when, as it, if Ravana could fly through the air, uh, with his chariot drawn by by mules, was it? By donkeys or something. Then certainly the Lord could also fly through the air with his uh, army of monkeys. Why not? Why would he not do that? Well, there's a reason why he's not doing that. And what is that? He is acting as a human being. His position in this Leela, he has to keep to that role of being human. And so in that role, he's not just going to jump and fly over to Lanka. Monkeys maybe can do it. Super monkeys. Hanuman can do that. But not Ramachandra, and not only that, he wants to engage his devotees, his, his, his monkey bhaktas. His monkey bhaktas are very enthusiastic and uh, they prove themselves capable to make this bridge. And uh, when they are successful completing the bridge, then, as the verse says, um, the Lord, with the direction, Vibhishana Drisha, of Vibhishana, the brother of Ravana, is going to enter into Lanka. Which Lanka? That Lanka, Lanka which is Agradadam which has been previously burned. The Bhagavatam, as you may have noticed, is poetry for the most part. There are also uh, prose verses in some parts of the fifth canto and uh, other parts. But that prose is also very poetic. But this is poetry at its best. And what does Sanskrit poetry do? How does it work? Well, one important element of poetry is what's called dvani, suggestion. Agradavdam, previously burned. What does that suggest to you about what's going to happen? Huh? No chance. No chance, yes, that's a good way to put it. No chance for Ravana because it's already been burned. The job is already done. Uh, and so we, as, as we listen, as we hear, of course we know, as 
uh, Shukadeh Goswami says to Maharaj Pariksha, you already know what happens. So we already know what happens, and yet we have some kind of anticipation what's going to happen. Uh, this was the case uh, some decades ago. Here in India there was a um, broadcast of the Ramayana uh, in a television series that went over a, a one-year period. And uh, it was broadcast, I believe, every Sunday morning. And the report was that the whole country shut down during that one hour because everyone was watching. <laughs> and when it got close to the end, it was beginning to approach the end of, of the story. And everybody who's watching knows the story. Um, the producer of this series started getting letters. Please keep it going. <laughs> Don't stop it. They were demanding, you can't stop this story. So he had to stretch out the story. He had to slow it down, so to speak. So everyone knows what's going to happen, and yet we want to see, we want to hear what's going to happen. But we get a hint of what's going to happen. Agradagam, it's going to be uh, again destroyed. Okay, I want to say something about uh, this notion of Satum, uh, because once or twice in Shiva Prabhupada's books, he points out that there is um, the notion of Dharma Setu. And of course, Ramachandra is very much, as we know, he's called Maryada Purushottama. He is, he is the Lord of Boundaries. Maryada has the sense of boundary, uh, of propriety. Uh, he's contrasted with uh, Lord Krishna, who is Lila Purushottama. Um, and as such, Ramachandra is especially celebrated as championing uh, the uh, protection and establishment of Dharma. There's this notion of Dharma Setu, and we may think also of this Setu, this bridge that Ram and the soldiers are crossing over as a kind of Dharma Setu. Here is uh, one explanation from Srila Prabhupada. This was from a lecture he gave in 1971, Srimad Bhagavatam. Prabhupada says, really, originally, the regulator of religious principles is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, Krishna is sometimes addressed as Dharma Setu. Setu means bridge. We have to cross over. The whole plan is that we have to cross over the ocean of nations in which we are now fallen. The material existence means it is ocean of ignorance and nations, and one has to cross over it, then he gets his real life. Elsewhere, Srila Prabhupada, uh, in, in a word-for-word, -word, translates Dharma Setu as protect, protector of Dharma. The word Setu means bridge, but it also means, when you look out in the uh, remaining uh, rice fields of Mayapur, I say remaining, there used to be so many more rice fields around here, but now there's so much more construction. Uh, the, uh, the earth that divides one rice field from another is a setu. It is holding in the water and it is keeping out something from the other side. That is setu. So, dharma setu could also be understood in this way. It's like protecting, keeping uh, something which is not desired from coming in. 
But if we go back to the idea of Dharma Setu as, uh, as the bridge of Dharma, uh, I find this interesting in relation to our um, many discussions about, um, about preaching. We know that our society is a preaching mission and uh, we uh, are constantly reflecting on what are the most effective ways of preaching and so on. And in recent years, there has come an expression, to my knowledge, the Prabhupada did not use this expression, but it came up, to my knowledge, initially through uh, some, um, some books that were pr produced um, either by the BBT or by others, and the term came up uh, bridge books, and then came bridge preaching. And then the notion of bridge preaching, like so many things uh, in our society, became something of a controversy. Whether bridge preaching is a good thing or not a good thing, uh, whether it's too in, whether it means indirect, and if it's so indirect, is it even preaching or or what? So a few months ago, uh, I was invited to give a presentation at the European Leaders Meeting in Hungary, uh, where one of the topics was bridge preaching. So they asked me, they put me on the hot seat uh, to say something on the subject. So I gave a presentation in which I quoted what I just read. And I also quoted this um, from Srila Prabhupada. This is from a letter to uh, Siddheshwara uh, Krishna Kanti, 1972. Srila Prabhupada said, We should not compromise in any way just to accommodate the public idea, but we can so tastefully present the real thing that we will change the people to accommodate us. I like this um, expression especially because it's so inclusive uh, in, men, in, in two different ways. One is, there is this concern that if we are, if we are doing bridge preaching in the sense of indirect, it becomes more and more indirect uh, to the point of watering down the message and perhaps ending with uh, mission drift. <clears throat> then, what is the value of that? So we are reminded, Srila Prabhupada says, we should not compromise in any way just to accommodate the public idea. But, and then comes the other side. But we can, I, I'll put in, insert my words, we can make a bridge. Uh, namely, we can tastefully present the real thing that we will change uh, the people to accommodate us. So there's, there's bridge building, and what is bridge building? It means, again, bad, badha, making a connection. And finally, on this point, I want to quote uh, my godbrother, Gorakeshava Prabhu, who was interviewed uh, to, uh, sh to share his memories of His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami, the late Bhakti Tirtha Swami. And uh, he, I would say, he gives kind of a definition uh, of bridge preaching here. He says, he, Bhakti Tirtha Swami, was expert at what we call bridge preaching. That is, and now he's giving a, like a definition. He was able to help people outside the Krishna consciousness Krishna conscious tradition, work their way in. He gave them points of similarity, 
points of interest, allowing them to more fully appreciate the Krishna consciousness tradition. The results speak for themselves. We now see him being appreciated all over the world. So the Dharma Setu, what I want to suggest and what I suggested in my presentation in um, Hungary is that all, all good preaching is bridge preaching. In the sense that we're making a connection, an effective connection that makes it possible uh, for ourselves to connect and by that connects people to the Lord. And by that connecting to the message of the Lord, uh, the, the Dharma message that the Lord brings when He comes, every time that He comes. So these are some thoughts. Uh, I will stop there, uh, except to say one more uh, comment, which I meant to bring the quote that I, so I could read it properly, but it slipped my mind, but it comes from Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur, uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase, he's saying that the pastimes of the Lord are, are just that, for the Lord they are his pastimes, but for the devotees they are uh, opportunities to serve. That is to say, he's suggesting we participate in the Lord's pastime uh, in service. That is our relation to the Lord's pastime. So in this verse we see uh, the participation of Sugriva, Nila, Hanuman, all the monkeys. They are serving in the pastime and this is how they are participating. How do we participate in the Lord's pastimes, especially by preaching, by making bridges uh, to the world who is as yet disconnected from the Lord? Hare Krishna. Any question, comment, complaint? Other lots of one. Do we have another microphone? It seems somewhat strange to me because that this is even a discussion. I mean, I know there's a concern that when you get on the bridge, you get off the other side. And so people are concerned that people get on the bridge, but they don't make it to the other side. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can empathize with that. But Srila yeah. Prabhupada was such a bridge preacher. Yeah. And, and from the point of view of his godbrothers, he was radical. Yes. And from the point of view of us, we think, you know, well, he was so conservative. But from the point of view of his godbrothers, Prabhupada was totally radical. Yes. And he was a bridge preacher. He was Krishna West, so to speak. <laughs> yes. um, so, um, it, it, it's a little confusing to me why this question is there. I mean, why it's Why is it an issue? Yeah. I suppose it's, it's going to be like that in every generation. Uh, one devotee uh, in Finland, Rigupana, did his doctoral dissertation on the subject of uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava Guru tradition. And he researched, um, part, part of his research was to interview many uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava Gurus in his town, in various Gaudiya Mats, and in other Gaudiya Vaishnava traditions. And one of the uh, things that he does in his dissertation is to identify the various roles of the guru. I think 
Kid came up with six different roles. And, you know, that's a whole subject and a whole lecture in itself, but he, uh, two of them are, he is a preserver of tradition, and he is an innovator. <laughs> he doesn't use quite that term, but it's something like, in order to carry the tradition, he is also um, he, has, he has to, he or she has to bring innovation of some, uh, according to circumstances. So both are there, and our, our tendency is to hold fast to that with which we are familiar and which we are assured is right, and if something new appears, I think it's natural that we are hesitant, uh, that we, we don't jump and embrace anything and everything that comes along. Some of the, the so-called brilliant ideas that we might hatch from our fertile brains, um, you know, might might not be so good. <laughs> and of course, the question that we always want, the way we want to frame the question whether something is a good idea or not in preaching, uh, brings us back to the subject of principles and details. Are we holding on to principle? And is what we are innovating a detail? Or are we, uh, are we tinkering with a principle and possibly getting in trouble with that? Of course, what happens is one Vaishnava's principle becomes another Vaishnava's detail and vice versa. And that's where the controversy comes. And then a, 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 another point I would make is one we've discussed in a seminar that we just completed uh, in uh, the Vaishnav Academy, that uh, we are often finding ourselves rushing to one or the opposite side of what is actually a false dichotomy. A dichotomy is there are two options. There's either option A or option B, and there's nothing in between. It's not A and B, it's A or B. A lot of circumstances in life are like that, and indeed we are forced to make decisions where we choose one or the other. But also a lot of cases are not really di dichotomies, but they seem to be a dichotomy. And that is what is called false dichotomy. And so I think a good question that we can ask ourselves when, whenever we see this either-or situation is to ask, is it really either-or? Is that all right? No. Yes. Yes. This idea of allowing, managing clarity, thinking, and yeah. 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 Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. In other words, the idea that either a traditionalist approach or a modern so-called innovative approach are mutually exclusive is a false dichotomy according to what you just presented. We see that ISKCON is growing all over the world and there are so many different demographics and people to reach with different methods. And according to the situation, 
that bridge to reach them in the manner of bridge building, uh, we should be mindful not to get lost right. and <laughs> not come back exactly. to the other side of the bridge. Which yeah. is what happen by going, taking the scenic route. <laughs> the scenic route. <laughs> and, yeah. So, what are some of the things that you suggest we do to keep tradition and innovation alive at uh, the same time, even though know, the mind likes to see how to keep the balance. Yeah. Um, in brief, very brief, because it says, please finish by 9 o'clock. Two minutes, not two hours. Um, well, one, one point that Srila Prabhupada encouraged was, come to Mayapur once a year. <laughs> Get back in touch with the Vedas, come back to Mayapur. <laughs> um, that's, that's one point. Another regarding tradition is, I think there is value in uh, connecting also with uh, the wider tradition. There is a wider tradition. There is ISKCON, um, but there is also the wider Gaudiya tradition. There is the wider Vaishnava tradition. And, yeah, this is one reason I think we sometimes will go on pilgrimage. Devotees like to go to South India and see the big temples because it feels like, yeah, there's so much tradition here and so on. These things are they're nice, they're good. Um, and keep our ears open, and that means especially hearing, hearing Shastra. But hearing, and we always want to go just a bit deeper each time, you know. Not, oh, I've heard that before, but yes, I've heard that. Have I really heard it? <laughs> Have I heard it so that it's really going to my heart? Is there a bridge that's going to my heart? And this would be the, the last point I'll make, because I only have 20 seconds. Uh, is that in building bridge, preaching really has to come from the heart. If it's coming from the heart, it's reaching to the heart. That's when it's, that's the real thing. Isn't it? And everything else is details. <laughs> Yeah. yeah.